First of all, how many of you have seen my Programmer Anarchy presentation? Nobody. Oh, one. You heard about it, but you haven't seen it. Oh, it's too bad. Oh. Yeah, I think I did that last year at the conference. The, the sort of thumbnail summary of Programmer Anarchy is we get rid of the business analysts, we get rid of the testers, we get rid of the project managers, and in fact, the programmers have no managers at all. Uh, and it works really well, which is scary for an audience in a management con agile management conference. Which, which is why they didn't put it on the schedule, apparently. For the programmer's side, they think it's a really good idea, though. Uh, um, yeah, so actually, you yeah, may have questions about that, right? Uh, yeah, so I did this at a, uh, a London startup uh, called Ford Internet Group, uh, which was 35 people when I joined them in 2006. And when I left in 2011, there was a 470 people. So kind of one of these explosive things. And sort of my job there was to make sure a process didn't happen. Uh, so uh, I got enough gray hair, I'm old. So you know, these are the things that allow you to make sure nobody else tries to take over. So I kind of took over, but make sure nobody else took over. And then made sure we didn't have process, too much process put in place. Part of my career, I was actually in IBM. Uh, I did 17 years in IBM. Fun time, I had a lot of fun there. But part of my role at one point was process. I had process responsibilities for defining processes. So I got to know a lot about how to build a process and how to make processes work. But I also learned something interesting, which is how to get rid of a process and, and determine when it doesn't work. Uh, so I, since then, I probably kill more processes than I start. Uh, I think I have to make up for all those years in IBM. Uh, so, that, so when I go to heaven, it's going to be balanced out that I didn't create too many processes in my life. Because uh, I think that kind of creates hell for the rest of the world uh, when you create processes. All right, got to have a question. <laughs> Are you a project manager? Uh, so the, let's start with business analyst. It's kind of like, why do I want to have somebody between me, implementation, and, the, and what needs to be done? So I mean, C Craig hit on this a little bit in his keynote. You think, think about it, he talked about there's there's some function you're trying to accomplish from a business value perspective. And, and, and he was railing against the idea that all these little segregations, they lose track of what's going on. So I, I mean, basically, I don't want to lose track of that. If you go back to, say, when I started writing code, which is in 1968, um, you know, my original clients, I'd sit down with the client and write, a, write code with them, because that's all there was. Because the program was you know, one or two boxes of cards. Well, this is a good question. How many cards were in a box of cards? There's not a gray hair in here, is there? No, that's playing deck. This is a computer card. So you're definitely too young. It's 2,000. There's 2,000. It was about this long. It had 2,000 computer cards in it. But a big program was two boxes of cards. That's 4,000 lines of code. That's nothing. Of course, I can get my head around 4,000 lines of code and write an application for you, because they're very small. I think as it got bigger and bigger, we started deciding, let's put a bigger process in place. And, and certainly in IBM, we said, you know, building software is like building a big 370 computer. You got process, is a process associated with that, let's use that for software. So we adopted engineering practices. But we got ourselves further and further away from understanding what the customer wants. With the advent of the cloud, the advent of service-oriented architectures, and I do talk about microservices, I think, on Friday, uh, all of a sudden, the applications got t are small again. So I can get my hands around this because I'm using cloud services for deployment. There's a lot of other services I can leverage off of. I just have to write this little bit extra to make it an application for you. I'm back down to where I used to be. Uh, the day traders in London and Wall Street have discovered this a long time ago. Day traders have programmers that are assigned to them. They're constantly developing tools, releasing them several times a day to support that day trader, completely ignoring the IT organization. They'll use languages that are not supported. They'll do processes that are not supported. Doesn't matter because this is the guy they, I need a service and he pays my bonus. And I don't care what the IT executives say. So you have, you're having this emerge that all of a sudden we're getting back to writing small applications, delivering them very quickly, and cloud has enabled us to do that. So we're slipping back into that mode where I don't necessarily need a business analyst to sit between me and my customer. I want to have that more direct relationship with them. Uh, and in my environment in Forward, which is where, I, where my startup was, uh, we had that smaller environment. Uh, we were kept in environment, we were servicing our own internal clients. And so I could find them in the building. 
I could sit next to them, I could write code for them. And so the, the need for the business analyst kind of went away. Um, QA is an interesting one. By the way, this is not the official talk, this is the preliminary talk. Uh, uh, QA is interesting because you know, QA, if you look at the tools it takes to do QA versus what it took in 1970, I mean, we're talking about Cucumber, and we're talking about uh, uh, Selenium, and we're talking about sophisticated tools, and sort of analysis of these tools, and, and you have to be a programmer to use these things. And you think about the things we're trying to test now. We're testing these distributed systems that they have over here, and the server farms, and there's clusters over here, and they're connected to the web. Well, you almost have to be an architect to understand what the system looks like in order to really exercise it well. So the lines are blurred between, between the traditional QA role and the traditional programmer role to where a good QA for most systems needs to really be an architect. He needs to be a developer. They use these languages effectively. He needs to follow all the same programming rules we use and probably use Agile practices to develop his test scripts. The, the difference is completely blurred. In addition, we're kind of moving from basically what I would say would be uh, acceptance testing is something I do and then I ship it to moving to an active monitoring system. So we want to put a system out there but continually watch it to make sure it's still working because it has all these dependencies upon all the services. So you'd like to be able to, to for example, you know, I know I have a training firm that basically you know, just, just deploys the system without acceptance testing. But they continually run little $100 transactions through the system. You know, maybe you spend $100, buy some IBM stock, immediately sell it, you know, get $90 back. So they lost $10. But they're continually testing that, so when they push 100,000 through, they know it's going to work because of all the external service dependencies. So acceptance testing has kind of disappeared and but, but sort of become active monitoring of your environment. Yeah, I think, I think to, in terms of modifying the existing system and trying to introduce agile practices and the Michael Feathers and his philosophy and his books around that and, and what Bob Martin talks about, it, it's absolutely perfect. That's state of the art. Uh, in my world, I, fortunately, I get to build new things a lot and I new, build new things in a way that's easy to change. I'm building entire services, uh, using, message, using event busing rather than any sort of you know, database, transactional databases. Uh, it's kind of a new world out there. And it's, it's kind of still fun. We'll see if I'm officially getting started time. Close. We're kind of filling up. Um, perhaps I should start the real presentation. Oh, wow. Who's that guy? It's always disconcerting when you see yourself up there. Uh, that guy's really old. All right. Uh, yeah, fortunately he's gone. Good. Um, so this is a new presentation. Um, so you're, you're the guinea pigs for this one. Um, so I'm not sure how long it's going to take, so if I, if I start rushing through it, it's because I, I mistimed it. So the title of the talk is Agile is a New Black. Um, if you're not from the fashion industry, this may seem a little strange to you, but there's, there's sayings in the industry, fashion industry, about gray is the new black. It was it became a very much a catchphrase in the fashion industry, because it basically said that what used to be a standard color for fashion, which is black, black's always safe to add into something because it's always a safe color. This fashion design was saying, no, gray is a safe color this year. And it, it keeps changing, apparently, all the time as, as fashion keeps changing. And the first sort of recorded instance of this was in the Los Angeles Times quoting this designer back in 1984. But it, it actually caught popular attention that, you know, something is a new black. And so I, I think Agile sort of has that same trick to it. So the concept of, of the form of X is a new Y, again, from the fashion industry originally, if you sort of read about this, it sort of designates something as really a versatile but staple part of the environment you're in. In other words, you, it's just part of it. Like black is just part of your fashion. Not, generally, nobody can say it's not true. It's kind of hard to say it's not true. Uh, it's also getting so overused, it gets to be trivial. And, and actually, X is a new Y is actually now officially on the banned words list, uh, which is maintained by some university in the uh, States. My concern is, I think Agile is headed this way. That it's almost getting to the point where it's just, you have to say you're Agile, otherwise you're not going to get the business, even though it may not be true. Uh, it's clearly you can't object to being Agile. Oh, you can't be Agile. Why not? I mean, what's wrong with Agile? Uh, overused? Absolutely. I mean, there's entire conferences talking about it. Um, we haven't made the banned word list yet, but I think it's coming. I certainly have some colleagues that refuse to use the term anymore. So, what I really want to say is, I would say you're not Agile if you're doing Agile the same way you did it a year ago. 
that agile is about is itself agile. It should be changing all the time. If it's not changing, you have stopped being agile. Last year, if you go to the conference and describe what you're doing, I'd say, yes, you're agile. You came back in this year and told me the same thing. I'd say, you stop being agile. You're not there anymore. I want to illustrate this by you know, what I consider uh, a set of things. First of all, I, which project doesn't need to change its needs over time? You know, every project should be a little bit different. Even within a project, it should be changing. The change is always there associated with Agile, but we're, not, we're trying to treat it as some static thing I could write down and hold on to. So I'm going to talk about some Agile smells. And I'm borrowing this from Kent Beck, who talked about code smells in Martin Fowler's refactoring book. These are things that if you, if you feel yourself doing this, there's probably something wrong with your Agile. It's beginning to smell. And I'm going to do it. I'd like you to actually, since people have papers around, uh, let's make a scorecard, because I'm kind of curious what the answer is going to be. So divide your scorecard up into two columns, you know, the happy side and the not so happy side. And we're going to sort of put up little things, put some scores up there, and please write them down, because I'd like you to add them up at the end. And I'm kind of curious as to what your score is going to be. And regardless of what your score is, try to find me sometime during the rest of the conference and tell me what your score is, because I'd love to talk to you about this. All right. First of all, Agile is not waterfall. And we basically stole this process from the manufacturing technology area. Uh, we basically say, you know, software made out under Agile is not really a manufacturing, pro it's a more of a manufacturing process, not a traditional civil engineering process. And some side effects of that is you should be using Gantt charts, you should sort of have some sort of work in progress charts. You shouldn't be talking about how many projects you're starting as a metric, you should talk about how many things you've finished in a time period. So, first score, if you use stories in your Agile process, give yourself five points. If you have a card wall, give yourself 10 more points. This is good. If you have Gantt charts anywhere in your, in, your, in your walls, subtract 10 points. If you have Microsoft Project installed in your system, subtract 25 points. All right, we cool? Everybody's got their score? Let's go to the next one then. All right. Iteration length. Uh, iteration length has been very interesting if you track it over the last decade or so. Um, you know, I, I got involved in Agile you know, around the 98, 99 time frame. The original XP, which was actually the fastest of all the cycle times of all the processes out then. I mean, we had some, we had some stuff from Rational, we had some, some stuff from uh, a few other crystal processes and other things, but at that time, as I recall, the fastest, one of the fastest cycles was, was Kent Beck's Extreme Programming. And it had sort of a suggestion that iteration should be two or three weeks long. And my experience was that's where I kind of started at that point in time when I adopted it. But pretty much by, by another four or five years down the road, it came down to one week. And what was going on was when it was three weeks long, it'd be like the first week we would kind of rest, and the second week we would work, and then the third week we'd get panicky and actually get productive. So we cut out that first week. So now we're kind of working and panicking. And then it was like, whoa, panicky is really productive. So we killed it down to one week, and then we kind of just churned from there. But actually, it didn't stop there. I think as I kept going on and on, iterations actually disappeared. Actually, what happened was the iteration became a day long. Basically, at the stand-up meeting every day, we decide who shows up and what needs to be done. And let's match them up, and that's today's plan. And tomorrow, I'll see what's important, because it may have changed. And I'll see who shows up, because that may have changed. And I'll match them up. So my planning horizon became you know, 24 hours. Uh, if you get to anarchy, it actually has disappeared completely. I mean, they just kind of do what they need to do when they need to do it. We won't get into that it's scary stuff for this audience. Uh, so that's iteration length. So if you should measure what your cycle time is when you're counting these things. And give yourself you know, five points if you're at two weeks. Give yourself 10 points if you're at one week. 25 points if you're down to the day where it's completely disappeared. Now, by disappeared, it means it, it did exist at one point in time, it's gone, not never existed. Um, Give you, subtract 10 points if your iteration length is the same as it was a year ago. Subtract 10 points if it's more than two weeks. And if it's more than a month, subtract 25 points, because you don't get it. Not that I'm prejudiced on these things. Um, OK, ready? Another smell. Rolls. Oh, this was one of my favorites. Um, and I think we did a lot of nice stuff about roles, and then we kind of gave up, gave up on it and went the wrong direction. So I kind of believe in my world that there's basically three major types of roles in an Agile project. 
uh, management roles, business roles, and development roles. And traditionally, you know, taking some of the traditional titles and laying it into the structure, you, get, you kind of scatter the titles this way. You notice I always put QA on the business side because basically QA is all about testing at the story level, not, not the implementation. So I tend to put them over there. And one of the nice things we talked about and what happened over the last few years with Agile was that we kind of blurred all the roles together relative to development. We just called them developers. And I mean, Ken Schwaber even went further with his scrum. He says, it's just team, team members. Why do we need all these other labels? They're just team members. And that really was spot on. I really like that concept. Iteration manager, I always want to make a few comments about that one because that's clearly a made up role. That was not one of Kent Beck's original roles. That came into being because uh, when ThoughtWorks was starting to do some projects, uh, just the beginnings of Agile in the States, uh, they wanted to put their own project manager in there to make sure it was run correctly. But the, project, the uh, client would say, no, excuse me, I have my own project manager. I don't need yours. But they really needed to have their own guy in there, so they put a new label on it. They called him Iteration Manager. And that, we, we institutionalize that almost too much. It really is kind of the same role. Um, now, what's happening is, all of a sudden, new roles are popping up. Well, yeah, we try to kill all these things. In fact, to some degree, customer, BA, QA, that kind of all bleeds together very nicely as well. Um, we're starting to get new roles, like scrum masters, and agile coaches, and you know, DevOps, and more titles are emerging every day, and, and even conferences are forming around things like DevOps now. Oh, we have a specialty called DevOps. There's even one I dug out, which is an IBM certified solution developer for RUP version 2.7.0. An official title for somebody that would be suggested by IBM. Um, this is not good. We're creating more and more titles. And I would say that as much as I enjoy Craig's keynote, every time he put another title on the charts this morning, I cringed. I was like, yeah, there's another guy. Oh, he's a business process. It's like, oh, please not. So, give yourself five points for every role you've killed in the last year in your Agile process. On the other hand, penalize yourself 10 points if you've added a new role, especially anything with Agile or Scrum or associated with it, into your organization, because you're kind of going the wrong way. I think the idea is, as long as you really are only talking about roles, I'm very cool with it. But unfortunately, these tend to be titles of individuals. In fact, I probably get, yeah, I walk to some shops, I say, where's the Agile coach? They'll point to somebody. What else does he do? He's the Agile coach. That's the bad. That's what you want to stay away from. People that understand Agile, absolutely want them. People that understand testing, absolutely want them. People that understand architecture, absolutely want them. Labeling them, bad idea. OK. Tools. Ah, I love tools. Uh, I, I've developed a lot of tools in my life. I've sold a lot of tools in my life. I feel guilty for it. Um, my favorite Agile tool. Give me some index cards, a good Sharpie, and we're off to the races. My second most favorite tool. Plop them on a wall. Very low cost. So this is uh, Columbus, Ohio, 2003-04, I think. Uh, Bangalore, 2004 and five when I lived here. China, 2005, Detroit, 2006, uh, London, later in 2006. Get the idea. These are the tools. Not very expensive. Easy to understand. Manages the process extremely well across many, many different environments and, and styles of programming. Another example of tool, the Rational Method Composer. I knew I could find one of these if I looked hard enough. And by the way, for a mere $1,000, you can have one for your each user. And you can actually get a quote in case you want more than that. And I, you can, I'll give you permission to use my personal priority code if you'd like to do this. Uh, you can, if you also feel, I can give you my email and you can mail it. If you have this much money, I can help you. <laughs> this is a bad thing. Yes. There, there are a lot of you know, things like JIRA, which is, which is overall cost per user is very, very, very low. It's fine for that. Uh, we used to take pictures of our card walls and email them to each other. Uh, in fact, what I did, in fact the, the first project I showed is a distributed project where we did have part of the team here in Bangalore. And that was still the card wall. 
and we take a picture of it. That's all we need to do. Of course, we have some very bright guys here. In fact, one of the speakers, Badre Janakaraman, is was one of the guys working on that project with us. And if you get a chance to listen to him talk, very, very smart guy. All right, so scoring. So if you're spending less than about 200 bucks on your tools per person, give yourself 20 points. You got it right. If you're spending as much as half a lakh on your tools per person, again, you got too much money, but subtract 25 points. If you get it down to a little closer to something more reasonable, then give yourself minus 10. It's kind of hard sometimes with a large organization to do less than that. But score yourself by how much money you spend on these silly tools. Because the tools will lock you into a process, keep it from changing. We don't use them. This is anarchy again, but you don't want to get it started on anarchy. We've already scared you enough on that one. Um, thank you for the question, though. You have rules about your columns, and rules about the cards, and rules about states of the cards. Now you're getting into dangerous territory. Again, tools like JIRA, where it's basically open-ended, you know, very easy to manipulate that, very easy to change it. Again, watch for the institutionalization. People locking it down too much. All right, agile process guides. Um, the tendency is to want to build these things, to create these things, especially to describe it to all your colleagues what your process is and begin to write this stuff down. Writing anything down gives it a life of its own. It's very hard to kill it once it's written down somewhere. So it's a really bad sign if you really got these things written down, and especially in, in lockdown in some format with special teams that own responsibility for maintaining the document. These are, these, actually, this org, part of the organization itself is evil. So give yourself 20 points if you haven't got a process guide. You're, you are in nirvana. Do not change that. Don't fall to temptation. If you have it on a wiki and you can, anybody can edit it, OK, you're OK, because it's easy to change. If it's on a wiki and somebody's locked it down and can only change it with permissions, OK, you're in dangerous territory again, minus 10. And if, over, if it's a real document somewhere, so you can pull it off and look at it officially and it's big, you know, minus 25, you're, you're in trouble. You've locked yourself in. You're not going to change. Large teams don't bother me at all. But that's, that's more of a long offline answer uh, that we're talking anarchy. But you can certainly find me after. I'll talk about how large teams shouldn't have this issue. I mean, Facebook doesn't have these issues. There are 2,000 programmers. You got more than that? We should talk. Bug tracking. Tracking bugs or fixing bugs. That's kind of almost the season of the quandary about what you want to do. So let me just draw some charts. So this is a project, uh, this was from China, actually. Oh, it comes, the resolution's pretty good. So it's basically a work in progress chart. It basically charts how many stories are in each state. So the green means stories that have finished. The white zone is stories that are, we haven't started on. And in the middle is in the churn. And there's a little area down in the beginning in the bottom, sort of bottom blue area, little blue bricks. They represent stories that have bugs at the end of the day. This chart is updated every day. So these are bugs at the end of the day, stories with bugs. Notice that there's, across this three-month project, there's about half this in the middle where, at the end of the day, there were no bugs, known bugs in the system. The ones that QA had found, we had already fixed those, and before we went home for the day. Contrast that to this project, which actually was a project I worked on here in Bangalore, where in their infinite wisdom, somewhere around the 9-11, uh, uh, which is an auspicious day for many reasons now, uh, they decided that they didn't want to fix the bugs as we found them. We will put them in a bug database. We'll fix them later. And all of a sudden, you see that little red zone jump up. Because now we're just accumulating bugs because stories are not finishing. The work in progress has basically come to a standstill because we can't finish off these stories. Now, in a previous picture, and actually even project before that, we actually calculated what the average time it took to fix a bug was. 15 minutes to find and fix a bug. Because it was the highest priority thing was, we got a bug. The bug is keeping the story from closing. We want to close stories. It's all about finish, finish, finish. So it would be the thing we'd go grab first, we'd work on it, we'd kill it off, and claim victory. That's the attitude. When this client decided they didn't want to fix bugs, and I argued vehemently for that. I argued across the ocean, because I was living here at the time, and failed to win over the client on that issue. I went back and calculated how much time did it take to fix the average bug. 15 minutes before, 
It now takes 18 hours to fix a bug. I have to find it. I have to make sure it's still there. It's not my bug. Now I have to go through the system and try to figure out why it happened. 18 hours for the average fix time, 15 minutes the otherwise. Oh, but if we put them in the database, we'll only fix the important ones. 15 minutes, how much time you want to spend on it. I've had clients argue with me and says, well, if we had a meeting about that, maybe we wouldn't have fixed all that, spend those 15 minutes. I said, it's 15 minutes. How much time do you think you're gonna spend the meeting talking about it? So, score yourself 25 points if you don't track bugs, you just fix them. 10 points if you track, track bugs, and 25 points off if you have meetings about fixing bugs and priorities and all the other things. Very evil thing. Yeah, I see some, yep, people feeling sheepish now. Permission to ship. Who do you have to get to get ship code? I want to give it to the customer. We talked about, you know, Craig talked about it this morning, that, you know, the person deciding this should be the customer. He should own the delivery process. He should own the, the product and its delivery. Excellent. Who in your organization has permission to ship? In Anarchy, we basically, developers can do that. Developers decide when they want to ship. In fact, you give yourself 25 points if your developers can just deploy to production. We do that in Anarchy. In fact, at Forward, we were, we were actually producing, putting something new in production every three and a half minutes. If it didn't work, we fixed it. Otherwise, we're getting it out there to see what customers really think of it. Um, give yourself 20 additional points if you're like Chrome, where it basically it just deploy, if it, all the updates just flow to your workstation, they don't ask permission, they just do it. This is, this is perfect. If you think it's better code, give it to your customers. Get it in production. If you have an ops team that has to be, do, do all the deployments, subtract 10 points. Because in the world of cloud, you shouldn't necessarily have this anymore. It should be DevOps. It should be flowing back into development. And if there's a sign-off sheet floating around your organization, subtract yourself 20 points. My, my current job, I, do, I, I walked in one day and I saw sign-off sheets floating around. I'm like, what is that? And I said, well, it's a sign-off sheet. It says, no, really, what is that? No, it's a sign-off sheet. I, I've told the organization that the first one of those that crosses my desk, I'm going to go to the shredder and shred it. So far, nobody has dared put one on my desk. So, score yourself accordingly. Are you allowed to make deployments? Or do you have to go get somebody's permission to do that, to decide what needs to be deployed? I do. Again, but I'm not working in gigantic applications. You're back to, in the Michael Feathers world of large applications. This is where you want to get to. And you want to evolve your architecture to support this. Um, on Friday, on, uh, yeah, on Friday, I'm talking, uh, tomorrow's Friday, no, Friday. No, Friday, I'm talking about microservice architectures, which is an architecture that allows you to do this much more easily. It's not the stuff we, we used to build. Uh, we do. What can I say? We do that. Because incremental changes are very easy. This is what J Japan did this with their, Japan killed the US you know, electronics industry by shipping incremental changes to products. The VCRs, the TVs, they kept incrementally improving them, and there'd be a new model every, every six or eight weeks. And the US cycle time was 18 months for those. You know, 18 months, the US had the best product, and then in incrementally, very quickly, Japan would catch up, and then they pass, and they pass, and they pass, and they keep churning the models constantly. You can churn these things extremely fast with software. We don't have the constraints that manufacturing have. If your deployment costs are high, you need to rethink your architectures, rethink your deployments, rethink your structure. But wherever you are now, you can probably still go faster with what you have. Focus on going faster. Oh yes, sure, everybody can promote to production. And, and that's the anarchy environment. So yes, we do that, and yes, it is scary. And, uh, and yet we, you know, we made uh, one million quid revenue per employee one year. It's not a bad idea. All right, process experiments. Do you experiment with your process? 
You know, the lovely thing about iterations when I used to have them was you could, you could propose a process change. It's really hard to go to the organization and say, oh, let's try this process, let's do this process change. It's like, oh my God, I thought it was going to work and we are going to debate it and whatever. It's much easier to say, let's try this process change for the next week or two weeks and let's see what happens. People who would say, no, no, don't try that, look unreasonable when it's a time-based experiment. Let's try this one and see what happens. When I was in ThoughtWorks, we definitely had some clients that tried not pairing, for example. They said, let's don't pair for the next iteration. Let's see what happens. Turns out the metrics just went in the toilet. And it's like, OK, now I understand why we're pairing. But we tried it. Now, we, now we're comfortable with the pairing idea. Iterations are lovely things to try pairing. A lot, of my, a lot of the innovations I've seen in processes have come from the teams themselves saying, let's try this. Uh, you know, let's don't write our test until after the story starts being played until the developers actually start. Let's not write the test early. Let's write it only when the actually developers get running. Let's try that. It was one of the teams, one of the QAs suggested that. I was like, that sounds a little strange, because we, we kind of want to know what the test acceptance tests are before we start software, but let's try that. It's amazing. It works amazingly well. So institutionalize that one. So process experiments are very easy to run, and you should be running them all the time. You should encourage it. Your retrospectives. Your retrospectives should always be asking, what can we try for the next period? I learned a lot of my retrospective tricks from, uh, from Owen over there. Stand up, Owen, wave to him. Yes, Owen and I used to argue all the time when we lived in Bangalore together. But one of the things I did pick up from Owen that he was right about is just clever ways to run retrospectives. And just th proposing experiments to run for the next iteration is a very, very powerful thing. Engages the team. Let's try something. Let's see what happens. So give yourself five points for every process experiment you've run in the last 60 days. Subtract 10 if you haven't done any in 60 days, and subtract 20 if you've never done any experience at all in the project so far, that you're stuck with what you got. Not a good sign again. Staff changes. When you put a team together, this is a team you need to live with for the project. That's patently false. That is just so wrong. This is not that fixed price cost thing. So my question to you is always, what project actually starts out with the right people? I mean, do you really know the right people to run on, put on a project? And do you think the project doesn't change its nature during its evolution? We're going from sort of architectural focus to, to database focus to delivery focus. Do you not think the process, the program changes? Don't you think the staff need changes with the project as it goes along? So you need to be thinking about how you change your staff during a project. One of my very first projects within ThoughtWorks, um, eight-month project, I made 10 staff changes in the first six weeks alone. I mean, I was given a team to work with. And I sent some of them back saying, no, not good enough. I need somebody else. Wrong skill. I need somebody else. I kicked a client programmer off the team. He's the, this is the client. This is the program he gave me. I said, no, bad fit. Doesn't want to work with us. Let's get rid of it. Worked. I even took the BA, the, the ThoughtWorks business analyst, off the project because we didn't need him. The customer could write stories themselves. They got and showed how to do that very well, so we made those changes. You can change your staffing throughout the project. In fact, if you're not looking at that every iteration, don't worry about process experiments, but also worry about, have I got the right people in the room working on the project? Because the answer is going to be almost no. There's somebody else that probably needs to be in here or somebody I can get, move out of the project because they're not necessary anymore. Plus, the people themselves are changing. Their, their skills have changed during the project. So, if you, you have, so basically, score yourselves. If you've got, for every staff change you've made in your project, add five points. Subtract 10 points if the only staff change you had are because people quit. Uh, I know that's a bit more endemic in this environment than in the West, but 10 points if people just quit. The only guy that's quit. And if you made no staff changes since you started the project, 20 points off because you're not paying attention to it. I would actually give you credit for five points. Yes, you finally found something. You got something on the positive side now? <laughs> Sorry. Um, requirements hierarchy. Um, this is a structure that uh, Greg Reiser, uh, former ThoughtWorks vice president, uh, drew. Uh, I thought it was a brilliant way to look at, look at uh, requirements. So in, his, in, the py in the pyramid, there are five tiers of the pyramid. Stories represent only level four. Of course, we break stories down into individual tasks per extreme programming, so that's level five. But there are also these higher level things that 
that these, are, these stories are part of some feature you're trying to implement, which is sort of some, some overall program or project you're working on, which, has, which is tied to some overall business initiative. The ability for Agile to track all our work up to some business initiative is very, very powerful, especially if you're working with the US and the support Zoxley or SOX stuff, where they want traceability. Traceability in Agile is extremely easy to do. Uh, when I started talking to the US about Agile and stuff like that and ran across my first SOX client, I drew, this, drew these pictures for them. They're like, whoa, this is perfect. Can we have this? I said, yeah, it's built in. Every test I'm writing is running against some story which runs against some feature which I can trace it all back. And they're like, wow, this is amazing. So most Agile projects, though, you, this is your interaction with the customer. You're supposed to be interacting with the story level. And that's what extreme programming talks about. That's what Scrum talks about. Uh, you're interacting with the customer at this level. However, very often I've seen it devolve into where you begin to micromanage. Either programmers are not delivering on time or you don't like what they're getting. So you sort of ratchet up the pressure a little bit. Say, tell me the task. Let's manage to the task. Let's put the task in a spreadsheet. Let's track your task. How many hours is it going to take you for this task? How many hours did it take you for the task? Why did it take you so many hours for these tasks? You can see where this is going. What you really want to be doing, and this is where programmer anarchy kicks in, is you really want to be interacting with a client the same way Craig describes it. What business problem are you really trying to solve? Don't give me the story. That's kind of too, that's the little micro view that Craig talked about. Let's talk about the bigger view. This is where you want to be working at. You want to be interacting with the client saying, what do you want to accomplish? And then you want to say, get out of my way while I make it happen. This is the continuous delivery sort of thing that anarchy preaches as well. So you really want to be working at the feature level. So give yourself 25 points if you're surfing at this very high range of working at a feature level, that your interaction with the customer says, what do you want to accomplish, and you deliver it. This is the world of startups as well. Give you five, five points if you're at story level, which is kind of where you should be if you're running Agile officially. If, you got, if you've been dragged down to the task level by some other issue, minus 25. Yeah, so, what, what, so I, I, don't, I don't track a bug, but I do write a unit test to make sure the bug never occurs again. So it's part of my code base. So that, that bug's been fixed. I may even write a comment about what the bug was when I, when I fixed the bug, but basically I fix the bug the same way I write code. I figure out what the bug is, I write a test, unit test to make sure I understand the bug really is there, and then I write the code to fix it. Then I check it in with everything else. Okay? So, how well have you done? Has anybody got a positive score? Total. Not just in a positive column. Okay, you guys I definitely want to talk to afterwards. So you're doing some cool stuff and I want to learn it. Um, the guys are getting, if you have less than a minus 100, you're actually doing pretty good. Because I would suspect that that's actually respectable range. Because you can drag that to a, if, you're, if you have more than a minus 100, you're in trouble. You're basically running waterfall, uh, but you call it Agile. All right, so let me talk a little bit about my, how Agile has evolved where I am now, uh, from where I was before. So you know, I started Agile in 1999. I pretty much took Kent Beck's, uh, actually at, at one point in time I picked it up, it was one piece of paper driving extreme programming. Um, and basically I, I did basically what, you know, he had said in a piece of paper, as well as what the book said later, I followed it absolutely. So two, three weeks iterations, uh, well-defined roles as he described it. He didn't have, of course, the concept of an iteration manager, but he did have a concept of some sort of clerk that's keeping track of stories and, and other things like that. But it's just a clerk. It's not an important role. Um, it was a very prescriptive process. In fact, Kent Beck apologized in, in version two of his book about being too prescriptive in version one. And I told Ken, I said, no, no, dude, you need to be prescriptive as you're starting out. You need to tell me exactly how to do it. And then as I understand it, I can start playing with it. So your first, first edition was absolutely spot on for a brand new Agile team. Never apologize for that. And I followed that religiously. And we were able to basically ship it each iteration. If you want, the customer wanted to deliver the code at that point, we were perfectly happy to deliver the code every iteration. So again, we, we were subscribed to that, and we're executing that quite nicely. 
roll the clock forward a few years, uh, sort of one of my last projects, I think, in ThoughtWorks before I left. Um, basically, iterations that completely disappeared. We were basically in this daily sort of stand up is our plan environment. Uh, we did have an uh, iteration manager and project managers. Uh, I was in the process of trying to kill some of that stuff off. Acceptance tests had largely disappeared. We did, have a, we did have a QA on the project, but she was basically just building us a smoke test. It was a web-based application to make sure all the pages came up. But all the functionality about what was on the pages was all covered by unit test. And so we we're beginning to move away from you know, trying to do you know, acceptance level testing uh, rigorously at that point. It became basically a smoke test. Sort of pre precursor to the concept of monitoring, as I talked about before. And we were actually could ship almost any time the customer wanted it. We could probably take a day, build a WAR file, and deploy it. Actually, it was in C sharp, so it wasn't a WAR file. Uh, then we got to anarchy, which is what we did in, in my uh, in Forward Corporation. Uh, this is what I've talked about last year. Uh, just the scary part of these: these are the practices we got rid of in anarchy. Um, if you haven't seen the video and, and you haven't had a meal in a while so you don't get too, too upset, then you can watch the video. Um, but again, things start falling out and we go to basics. We're back to the basic principles behind it. Feedback, uh, communication, respect, uh, simplicity. We go to those basic principles and don't need a lot of this other structure for it. And now, uh, I'm sort of the point where I'm now implementing anarchy. Of course, anarchy at that point was into a startup. So I was in a startup. I was at a very, at a very young age of the startup. I was able to keep all these negative processes from forming. The documents were never written about processes and the like. Uh, so that was easy. But what if you try to do anarchy in an existing organization? So after I left Ford, I was looking for an organization to do this in and was fortunate to find one, uh, which is Mail Online, which is the online version of the Daily Mail. Uh, the Mail Online is actually the largest, uh, has the largest circulation of any online newspaper in the world. We passed the New York Times last year. Um, the company is really old. It was established in the late 1800s. Lord Rithermere, the Lord, you know, a true Viscount, is, a, you know, fourth generation is, is in charge of the company. Uh, the Mail Online itself, the product has been out there, I think, 12, 13 years. So it's, it's, a, it's an old, old web product, originally built with Oracle, with PL SQL scripts to build the web pages. That's how bad it is. Um, so the challenge is, how do you go into this and establish anarchy? So this is the challenge I was given and brought into the company with. So to sort of summarize where we were and where we wanted to get to, we were in a place where projects were taking three to six months. We actually established a special team for doing little tiny projects so we could keep the customers happy. The things that we were deploying, that team would deploy once or twice a week. So little tiny changes that just need to be done that weren't sizable for a project. We organized ourselves around specialists. We had front end guys sitting together. We had the back end guys sitting together. We had the deployment team sitting together. We had a design team using Photoshop sitting together. Uh, you know, very classical sort of dedicated testers. Uh, no business analysts, interesting enough. Um, and we were a scrum shop. We had stories, we had tasks, we had task walls. and and story cards and everything else associated with it. We wanted to move to something uh, more, more along the lines of anarchy, where we basically want to put together things that projects that only ran a month or less. Now, these are very fast to the point we're producing, much faster than they were. We might have a longer project if we're trying to build a brand new iOS app. I don't think we can necessarily do that in three or four weeks. It may take a little longer than that. We've changed our people focus from trying to be specialists to having these poly-skilled workers. I'll talk more about those in a minute. But these guys who could probably do more than one thing, that are able to sort of shift their role as the needs arise. And we're going to value these people the same way as we would an expert. So somebody who is maybe a world-class CSS front-end architect, uh, we would value them the same as one of these guys who could do lots of things in parallel. Because there's lots of things in parallel, I can take the things that Craig talked about and turn that guy loose on them. And he understands this part's a database problem, this part's a front-end problem, you know, some deployment stuff you have to worry about. He can sit there and understand that picture. We're going to be very aggressive in our Agile. Read that as anarchy. Uh, so we're basically forming ourselves tables of five to eight individuals, uh, largely untitled. Uh, they will get the job done. They own the job all the way through, including deployment. We will rotate as needs, needs necessary to sort of balance the teams and make sure the skills. So if the team says, I need some more skills, we'll 
slide somebody else in that has the skills. If they get surplus of skills, we'll take somebody off the team. But we're going to move them constantly as the needs of the project change. So how do we actually accomplish this? We took a very people first focus to this. The idea was, uh, I'm a big believer in this kind of master journeyman apprentice model, or Shuhari, if you're listening to Dan North, and I think there are lots of other labels for this. So I kind of like the three-tier version. And we also identified what we think are key technologies for our business. And we think this technology list will change over time. In fact, if I had my druthers today, I'd, I'd wipe job off the list in a heartbeat. Because as, as was expressed by in one of the uh, Australian conferences I went to last year, anybody who's writing new code in Java is being completely irresponsible. Uh, I kind of believe that. Uh, I'd probably also wipe testing off, but I would substitute domain expertise. It's important for the people working on that to understand what problem they're trying to solve. And my experience is in the really good QA people are people who understand the business problem, because that's they're thinking about it from those terms. And sometimes the programmers have had blinders on about that. For mostly our own fault, but we created those blinders. So I don't think this list will get much longer than a dozen items, and will change over time. But in each one of these tiers, we can define each one of these you know, tiers of competency in each one of these skills. A journeyman is somebody who's competent in the technology. They can use that productively and do an entire day's worth of work on that technology, be it database technology, be it perhaps uh, front-end work, whatever it may be. Competent. Apprentice, not competent. In other words, they, they really need guidance. In other words, pairing with somebody who is competent, very good idea. They can begin to pick up the competence. If they're really focusing on it, an apprentice should probably become competent in technology within two to six, four months at most. Maybe six months if it's a tough technology. If it's taking much longer than that, they're not going to make it. You should probably try to separate them from a business or put them back in some other skill they can do. Now, masters. Masters are almost undefinable what it means. But it seems like, I believe, masters know other masters. It's kind of like the PhD program, getting your doctoral degree. If you think about how you get your doctor's degree, at least in the Western universities, I think it's true here as well, you study under a PhD. So you're a student of a PhD. And there's a PhD committee you're going to go to who will designate you as a PhD one of these days, assuming you pass all their tests. So you join the club because they know PhDs. If it was a checklist, I'd turn it into a journeyman thing. So I think there are masters, and the masters are the ones who probably do decide what it takes to be a journeyman, because they are the masters in their field. So using that as a background, we have redefined our roles from a human resources perspective. So I've gone to this company that's been in business since the late 1800s and said, we're going to have a new HR structure for developers. We'll talk about how well that went. So we're going to define this concept of a developer. I will be a title. That means you're competent in at least one technology, one of the key technologies. If you have to be competent in one of the key technologies to get scratched off the list, well, sorry, out of luck. Better get competent in something else. We'll have what we call a graduate developer, because we think we're hiring these guys out of university, who is not yet competent in any of our key technologies. Frankly, I don't think we'd actually hire anybody out of university who wasn't already competent in something like web services or, or something like that, because universities do a very nice job of training that. Plus, students are very uh, resourceful in terms of other things they would try out and try out in the university days. So I, I feel they would always be competent in something. And we have the concept of a senior dev, who is the expert. He's a master in one of these tech key technologies. Now, this is the traditional structure. You come in as a trainee. You get to be competent, and then you work your way toward mastery of the subject. But it's a trap, because once you get into that mastery, you can't go back and be a, be a trainee in some new technology, because nobody will pay you for that. You're stuck. We don't like the guys that are stuck like that. In fact, we value what we call system programmers, which are people who are competent, not experts, competent in somewhere between five to seven technologies sort of scattered across the stack. Probably at least some database, and one or two of the platforms, one or two of the languages. Competent. And we will pay these the same way we pay the senior devs. And frankly, we'll probably value them higher. Because these are the guys I can build my products around. I can give a project to a table and say, this feature needs to be implemented. And they can sort it out because they understand the database, 
from the front end, from the deployment scripts, from the performance architectures, they understand all those dimensions of the problem. They are competent in that. And they're good enough to know that if they don't understand it, they can grab an expert. The experts themselves will be floating from table to table very frequently. Because I, I need them, it's going to be a situational need, I'll learn something from them, get them to solve a really tough problem, and send them on to the next table. Because I now I'm competent, I can keep going. So we want to use them quite differently. And just in case we might want to have to aspire to it, we have the concept of a master developer. It was a guy who was a master in three or more technologies. Now, as a list of the organization that we inherited when I went to Mail Online, I had one person I would classify as a senior dev, nobody I would call a system dev, and everybody else was developer or graduate developer. That was the environment we were faced with. And so we went out to try to fix that situation. We went out and found a lot of system developers. Now, these are the people in organizations uh, that organizations value them highly, but they can't figure out why. Because they're not our best database programmer. He's not necessarily our best you know, front-end guy, but he seems to be a, a guy that once you put him into a project, it seems to work better. And most organizations don't realize this because he's poly-skilled, and it's something you want to encourage. And so we're deliberately setting our organization up, giving dual career paths to our developers. We're saying, developer, you can have your traditional career path of becoming an expert in your field, or become poly-skilled. We will invest in you to get you poly-skilled so that you're competent in other technologies. Because we feel you're an extremely valuable employee that I can give a problem to, and you can solve it. And we reorganize ourselves in the Daily Mail along these lines. So we went to HR and proposed a structure. What was HR's reaction? They loved it. They loved it. Because under the old structure, they always argue with employees about, oh, yes, according to this job description, you're not that level yet. Oh, yes, I am this level. Look, I've got, I got seven years' experience, and I got this. I have more experience here, but less here. I should still be a senior associate dev. And they say the, these arguments are endless, and there can't be one, because it's, it's a very subjective system. They're looking at this and say, oh, let's see, the developer is going to decide who's competent, not HR. And you're going to set that system up, not HR. You already got the criteria for this, not HR. Boy, this is going to, going to, I'm going to have nearly as many headaches here. It's very clear what it is. And by the way, if you lost one of your key technologies and you're no longer strategic skilled, I have a good reason to sort of either get you retrained or separate you from the business or get you into an area where you are competent in. But just because you're a Java programmer doesn't mean I'm guaranteeing you a job as a Java programmer in my organization forever. That's not competitive for my world. So HR actually loves this structure. Now, project-wise, how do you form projects? Well, since we are, basically everybody is a developer, there are no team leads. That's not a title anymore. Project manager, not a title anymore. Tester, not a title anymore. Those titles are gone. We don't have developers. And we'll sit them down at what we call tables. We call them tables because we sit at a table together. Instead of sitting one, my front end guy over there and the database guys over there and the deployment guy sitting over there. And they never talk to each other except with email. We want to put them at the table. And the table will form and take as long as it takes to deliver what it needs to deliver. And then it'll probably break up, maybe make some more tables. And maybe reform into different tables. These are constantly evolving structures. Who's the leader of table B? Well, assuming they need one, table B will figure it out. What if they need to change the leader? Well, table B will figure it out. It's a really interesting book that talks about how organizations can actually morph themselves. It's called The Invisible Hook. It's a book about the social organization of pirates. If you think about it, pirates didn't have a rule book. It wasn't some you know, Lord High Admiralty telling you, oh, you're going to be the captain, you're the first mate, and you're the second mate. No, there were no rules. And they organize themselves accordingly. If you want to get shipped from A to B, this guy was the guy who put in charge. They will sort of put him in charge, say, you can organize for this. And you get the shifts running, get people on the sales, they can do the sales and the sheets, and they get from A to B. But when they're attacking that merchant ship over there, they want this really big guy, the cutlass waving in the air. He's the one that's going to jump across the ship and lead us. So they'd morph the organization. And they were very comfortable with that. Tables will be working the same way. 
they need a leader, they'll name one. If they want to morph the leader because the needs have changed, they'll morph the leader. If the table needs some initial resource, they'll ask for it. So my role in this organization and my colleagues' role is we're the concierge. We're the guy that gets the tables things they need. So they need a certain resource, we'll get it for them. Need another PC, we'll get it for them. Need a bigger table, we'll get it for them. We're the concierge. Now, is this the last thing we're going to do with, with mail online? Absolutely not. In fact, tables and what we're talking about, tables of five to eight, this is only a stepping stone in my mind to even further change that we'll be affecting. In other words, agile is agile. It will continue to change. So I anticipate in 2014 that you know, our cycle times, delivery times will drop for a lot. I expect delivery times to get well under a week. In fact, it probably gets to where it was in forward, which was most developers are deploying about twice a day. We'll certainly get it down to deploying several times a week. A given team, when they're assigned a project, will deliver it on all the platforms. So they'll deliver, the plat they'll deliver it on the web-based system for the mail online, as well as the iOS and the Android platform. And if there's multiple platforms, each one for tablets versus smartphones, we'll deliver on all those platforms. The table owns the problem, the table will solve the problem. Now, I mean, need to stir in some resources to help them do that. As a need may arise, as a role as a concierge, we'll do that. But the table will ask for them, we'll supply them. We'll become more poly skilled. The tables will become more and more an independent running group. They're the ones that will do the hiring, they're the ones that will decide that people don't fit in the organization, they will decide to get this person off the table. He's not working out, he's irritating us, he's not getting anything done. Our role as concierge is to accept that, get the person off the table. So you can be voted off the island by the people in the game. We don't want dependencies. In fact, we're going to organize ourselves to make sure we don't have dependencies across tables. That's why the table implements across all platforms. I don't have an iOS table versus the Android table versus the web table. It's one table. I try to carve the project up so it's small, so they're delivering one small feature as possible at a time. That allows them to reorganize themselves, but they still focus on delivery. So I want to try to completely eliminate the cross-table dependencies. I won't get there 100%, but that's my goal. Because once you have that, you need to have a coordinator. And then, then, then you get all the titles that Craig talked about sort of popping up. Don't like those titles. Uh, you get career guidance out of your table. If you want to know what you want to be when you grow up, the guys that can know are the big programmers at your table. They can say, oh yeah, this is how, you, can, you can learn to be a front-end guy, it's easy. Or no databases, here's how you, there's non-SQL, this is good. Or perhaps you want to be an expert. But the programmers have that knowledge and they should be sharing with each other. That's where you get your real feedback. I'm not talking about appraisals, I'm talking about real feedback. So career guidance will be given by people at the table uh, to their colleagues. And finally, we move more into anarchy, where the hiring, the training, uh, is that way. I expect team sizes will devolve to one and two programmers working on any given thing. Again, very small seed sizes, exactly what happened at Forward as well. So that's where we think we're going. Uh, I would say no, but I would say I don't care with the label at that point. But I would say, yeah, is, it, is one person a team? No. No, I wouldn't say that. Two? Yeah, maybe not. Well, let's, let's see as a question after I get I'm almost finished here. Uh, so, I, sort of a walk away slide about this thing is it's basically talking about, okay, you looked at your scorecard, you, I've talked about how agile should be changing, you're not feeling like you're making changes. What can I do to get sort of agile restarted in my organization? So I keep, keep thinking about agile again and get it, kind of a fresh look at it. And sort of just my top list of suggestions off the top of my head and, and my colleague, she and I came up with this list. You can start process experiments. They're easy. Talk about an easy win. The next retrospective you have, try some process experiments. Run your retrospective differently. Have somebody else run the retrospective. Uh, if you haven't got ideas on how to run retrospectives, see Owen. Uh, he's, my, he's my Bible for all these things. Um, discard those process guides. If you've got a process guide, have a big celebration and burn it, or erase it, or if it's a big wiki, replace it with, you know, you know what part of, of our anarchy do you not understand? Uh, replace your whole guy with that. Uh, see if you can drop bug tracking in exchange for actually fixing everything as it happens. Fix, if something happens, let's fix it. Don't put it in the bug tracking system. Don't, don't log it. Don't have a meeting about it. Just fix it. Try that as your experiment for a week or two and see how fast you get. 
and how much, how much less meetings you go to. Change the metrics. If you're counting anything except finished things, drop those metrics. Only count things that are finished. Talk about the things you finished this week, not that you're still working on. Oh, I started this project this week. I got three guys working on this one. As far as I'm concerned, it's blah, 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 blah. You didn't tell me anything. I'm looking to listen for, oh, I finished this this week. I got three tasks done on this story. I'm looking for those completions. Uh, if you got agile coaches, fire them. If that's all they're doing, fire them. If they're writing code for you, keep them. If they're writing lots of code for you, definitely keep them. Uh, certainly take the title away from it. If they carry that as a badge or have a hat that says that, burn it. Hire poly-skilled workers. Look for them. Look for a guy who's got a CV that says, oh, I did some front-end work, and I, you know, I, or I'm a database guy, but I got this little side project I'm running. I got a website running. This is a guy you want to hire. He's, got, he's poly skill. He can bring that to the table. You want to talk about it that way. Look, I got a poly skilled worker. Why do you need them? Well, because some days I need more programmers that do this, some days I need more programmers to do this, and I'm never out of balance. I always can work on things. Very powerful. If you're really bold, go talk to your HR or about changing roles. You may find out they don't have a problem with it because the problems with the existing system are really ugly. And they would love to figure out a way around that. And you may be able to teach them how to do that. So, I uh, want to hear more. Not that I've told you too much. Uh, I got three other presentations at the, for the next two days on these topics. Uh, I'll talk a lot more about the people over process. That's tomorrow morning. Microservice architecture, which is back in the technical conference. This is how I build very, very, very tiny apps. Talking about starting from my time here in Bangalore in around 2004 and five, building a big app, and sort of my journey to, to smaller apps. And the secret assumption of Agile, which is something that Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham know implicitly, but never wrote down, that we forgot. So I'll talk about some of the training we go through, especially in the current environment, what training we go through to sort of get our programmers into this environment where they're highly productive. So that's the name of the story. This is why Agile is, is the new black. I hope Agile doesn't go the way of the saying goes, that it's a dynamic, evolving, constantly changing idea. I really don't care where you start Agile. You can start Agile pulling a Scrum book out from 1998 and start there. Great. Just keep changing it all the time. You'll get to where you should be very quickly. And that's it. Thank you very much.